Right, let's start. So welcome to our presentation. Uh, we will talk about code beam uh, as a foundation for digital twin in construction. So uh, yeah, the theme today, uh, bringing uh, the gap between vision and reality. So hopefully we will do that uh, during this presentation where uh, I will present some background about this total BIM concept. Uh, so I think the next. Yeah, uh, so I, I will present some background about total BIM, uh, what we see it as it is, and um, how that connects to the digital twin of a construction site, as we we, we discuss. And then after that, Efrem from Skanska will um, talk about structure of information and also show one of the projects we're working with. Uh, after that, we have Oliver, which also will connect maybe more to more environment product uh, product decoration and reuse of uh, information, but also of uh, yeah, we will talk about operation fees, where maybe more the construction worker in themselves by using the mobile phones actually creates data towards the digital twin. And then Michael will talk more about the user interface and virtuality and that type of stuff. So that is the plan for the next 60 minutes. Uh, but we can start something that you can have in your mind during the presentation. Why are we actually doing what we're doing? Um, I think we are striving to do some digital transformation of the construction uh, process. And if we just ask uh, chat GPT about what, what is actually digital transformation in the construction process, I think we have a good explanation what we will talk about today. So um, digital transformation is about um, using a technology so that we will talk about um, to make the entire construction process more efficient, cost efficient and collaborative. That's the key words which we will discuss. But also um, the shift from a traditional manual process to a more connected and data driven approach. So data driven is, is one important. So that is actually exactly what we are trying to do with this total beam stuff. Um, so we are looking for actually creating this dynamic single source of information on construction site. So what is total beam then? Uh, it's something that has emerged in, uh, in Norway and Sweden, I would say, uh, where maybe we go more all in on BIM or BIM as in its totality, where we set more stride towards uh, model-based construction. So we strive to get the model to be a single source of information, which we will look at later. Uh, so we have to have the BIM as a legal binding construction documents in that set, because if we have drawings above BIM, we will lose. Um, and then they will more focus on drawings to construction site than actually um, the BIM. We also strive to don't have any traditional 2D drawings. So traditionally, we push a lot of drawings on construction sites. So that is what we are striving not to have. Uh, we strive to have a more production oriented BIM. So we actually create a 3D model or a 3D representation of what we actually are creating on construction site. So in that sense, we have to have a big mind shift in the process, as I go back to the chat GTP again, where who is actually the, the 
receiver of the information. And that is actually maybe the construction site, construction manager, uh, workers and stuff like that. How do they actually want their information to be represented? But also, as I said, uh, technology has to support this. So it has to be an easy to use interface for the construction site. Um, and support for these type of mobile platforms. So if we go back in history, as I said, uh, it has been a, a lot of projects looking into uh, drawing less construction or model-based construction. Back in the days, they they worked almost with production-oriented ori views instead, where they have these type of 3D views representing or presenting how um, for the construction workers. But uh, 2009, new software occurred, StreamVim, and this is actually from um, Celsius project, which Big Sting was doing, where they pushed this way of working. So that is probably the first project uh, which went this way. So from that project, we have got a lot of inspiration for this way of working. But uh, if we were back in town, uh, BIM was supposed to change the construction process. We were back 15, 20 years, where it was supposed to go from this drawing-based process to a more model-based process. But what actually happened in reality, as we see it uh, today, is that we created two parallel processes where we had still got the drawings as the construction documents. <clears throat> so the focus was on drawing, so actually de delivering drawing to a construction site. So what's happening in the process often is that uh, when we are towards the deadline, of the design, it goes to deadline rush. And in that process, we, we start to focus more and more on drawings. And actually, in some projects, we have seen that they, they let almost the BIM model go. So what happened on construction site is that they cannot trust the model. So they cannot do quantity takeoff uh, and actually use it. So it's more used as a visual representation of what are supposed to be built. Um, so that is the issue. If we look at um, in UK, how much time we actually spend on uh, creating drawings in the design process, we can actually see that we spend about 40% of producing drawings. And if you look at this graph, all these green or actually the time we spend on uh, creating drawings. And here is where a site start. So the question is, maybe we could take this time, 40%, to actually do something better. More, maybe focus more on data. What, what should the construction workers actually need on construction site? Instead of just pushing down um, the beam to 2D drawings. And as you see, the focus is a lot. So this is some citation from the interviews with, with the designers during this process. A lot of 2D works are to actually make the drawings look nice. Another thing, and this is often what we see on construction site, where we have different drawings, but they are really difficult to actually understand. Um, as you see, and also if we actually look how they interact with each other, I, I would say it's, it's amazing how we actually can, could do construction on site. But if we have a 3D model, it's much, much easier. Also, if we look at the information, we have a lot of documents, 
drawings which are reference to each other. So often you have to go through a lot of different drawings and documents to actually get the information you actually need. So that is why we can come back to the sing single source of information where we have to think about the users. How could we create a system which helps a user? So I think if we look why we are using this total BIM concepts is that we want to um, put uh, BIM is what does BIM actually stand for today? It's both a parallel process between um, drawings and models. So we wanted to focus more on this all in BIM or model based approach. Uh, so why do we actually focus on uh, focus on drawings? Could we not do better 2023? Uh, and as as I said, we have almost 40% of our time we can spend on actually producing something better. So instead, we argue for that. Why don't we focus on what media is the best for actually support the design and construction? Uh, for actually creating better design, better design solutions. Maybe we could spend more time on actually thinking about the design for the production and assembly on construction site. Uh, and also have a better <laughs> communication. But also um, support the construction site in a better set. Where is the example? Um, so if you have a dynamic uh, uh, software which could actually section anywhere in the drawing, take the measurements to where the construction workers are at the moment. Uh, you can, so this is, you are doing on a mobile device, actually a tablet or a, or a mobile phone. So in this user interface, it's not actually the design team which decides where the section drawing are. It's actually the construction workers which could take any section in the building where they actually work. Often the workers maybe or the design team creating the section here, but maybe the construction workers are actually working here. So they don't actually have any information about the measurements in that setting. So by using this way, the construction workers or this or construction team actually start in a dynamic way consuming the information and the free freedom model in another way. By measurement, creating their own sectioning and views. Another thing is the data, as we said, uh, dynamic filtering of information. So in this case, we select one of these. And it's actually connect connected to the database, so we actually can see what type of product it is. And then we can start filtering out how many of these do we actually have in this uh, floor. So we can start to order these type of details directly from the model. So by linking the product, uh, thinking about more about the information, we can actually filtering in a more efficient way. So in this case, we filter on on the uh, what floor four, and now we actually knows that it's 118 um, objects of that type. So then we actually could order things. So that is also how we dynamically uh, use the information and the model. But also we have um, how we can do communication using the platform where you can actually take images, um, where you get the location on 
on where that is. Uh, that is something Ephraim will show later. Um, so it becomes also a communi communication platform, both between the design team and the construction site, but also between construction workers and subcontractors. Uh, if I want to show something from the project about work preparation and checklists, which they are doing, connected to the different objects. Mm -hmm. So here we actually start to actually create data during construction also. What are we actually assembling and how far are we on, on construction? What issues do we have during construction? But also, uh, we look at big students projects where they also use the model for quantity takeoff during tendering phase, where every subcontract gets <coughs> their own uh, quantities. You can actually be more efficient. Why should all, I think in this, this project, we had 35 different subcontracts. This. And maybe the bidding process, maybe it's 100 different subcontracts putting the, the bid. Should everybody actually go in and, and do quantity takeoff on, on drawings on all these? Do you think about how much money we actually spend on just uh, counting the same lines or components here? Why don't we just give them the quantities and uh, ISC files. <clears throat> so I think that is something we have to think about in the future. What information if is actually important during the tendering phase? So for instance, uh, at Lumin project, which Big Studio has, we're actually modeling the paint or also for the painter. And in that case, it's important to have um, both the color, but also the direction of light. So if we have light here, from here, we, we have to put more efforts to this wall than a wall on that side. Uh, yeah, so we are back here. Uh, I have talked a little bit about total beam information, as I said. Um, so, Ephraim, we talk a little bit more about structuring of information. Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> some twist on, on the Total BIM uh, uh, text there and said, well thought out structure for Total BIM. Because I see that uh, uh, we need some structure for the digitalization to be able to use the, the data in a good way. Uh, so I will use uh, this uh, project that Skanska has done with, together with uh, uh, Norder. Uh, and I, I have the uh, line the digitalization for table reading in whole stock. Uh, uh, and this is a kind of a small experiment, uh, a real life experiment. Uh, uh, and we will see what the well thought out structure for Total BIM can do in the in the construction project, a real project. Uh, and the <coughs> table reading has been a kind of an expression in how we iteratively uh, see how BIM from all stakeholders uh, connect and complement the holistic uh, understanding of the execution. And uh, Hopefully, we enable the creation of a digital twin of this project, and maybe we can upscale it to, to uh, use the knowledge here to, to create a digital twin of a, a city or, or a bigger projects. Uh, but I think I will start uh, uh, first here in some of my own thoughts. What I perceive is the result of the digital transformation uh, in my context. Uh, I think. Uh, I see we have this uh, uh, transformation from archives to the data holes. Uh, I can see that we are shifting from drawings to models. Uh, we can also see that we have this explode views with data sheets. Uh, and of course, we're starting to use this uh, 
collecting collecting data from some sensors, but in the beginning, uh, everything of this is really good. Uh, I think, and it uh, helps us explain and use the data in, in a good way. We get more accurate data uh, to analyze. Uh, but how do we add data during the whole construction phase uh, process to get uh, this as built instead of as planned? Because uh, I see that mm -hmm. we are uh, we are putting a lot of effort to do as planned. But how can we do as built? Uh, because that's, I think it's uh, more interesting. Uh, so if we look on the data, uh, and we see that the data come from a lot of sources, uh, and to to bring value to to the project, uh, the data needs to be coordinated between all the involved st stakeholders, uh, and uh, uh, we really need to look into this value stream and see how do we bring value to the to the project. Uh, and then we ask a question: Is it possible to to filter the information uh, to describe uh, the step by step pro process uh, in, in the project in the construction process? Um, uh, so here we said that. Uh, all this involved, how can they explain this part that we are constructing? Uh, and we got some inspiration from uh, the movie business. Uh, and here it comes this table reading uh, concept. Uh, could we table read each scene uh, in the construction process and uh, maybe to understand the, the process better? Uh, so we started up with the the disciplines that account for the most governing amount of information. And we did some uh, round table uh, meetings with, with these uh, disciplines to see if we can find some common uh, denominators that could unite the disciplines information uh, to be able to, to table read each thing, uh, but without disturb disturbing their way of working uh, and, uh, and how they structure their information in their within their discipline uh, and we didn't want to disrupt their comfort and ability to validate the accuracy of their information uh, and we came up with the d3 uh, product destinations mass deliverables and construction scope and we thought that these <laughs> could probably connect uh, the, these stakeholders and the rest of the uh, stakeholders or disciplines uh, So then we started to try to implement uh, these uh, the numerators in each discipline's BIM. And we evaluate the structure uh, of the information and the effect this had on uh, in unite the discipline's holistic understanding uh, of the execution of the uh, construction. Uh, and as you see, this is a kind of an iterative process. And uh, it was a lot of struggles uh, because uh, when you sit together in the round table and then you discuss your information, uh, you see that uh, there's a lot of conflicts and uh, it's a uh, deeper uh, uh, silos. Uh, uh, and it's kind of, a, uh, you can see that the manuscript process for a construction movie is more complicated than we 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 imagined from from the start. Uh, how can we describe each scene? Um, uh, and I was going to further a bit about these uh, denominators. And the first uh, product destination is uh, seems like a quite easy task. It's just the vocabulary used in the in the project. Uh, but it's really interesting to see how creative people uh, develop. Uh, their own uh, designations uh, when they joined the, the product. Uh, so we started to uh, create this. This is how we talk in horse talk and uh, put up uh, the most important designation that we are going to use. Uh, everyone is, is going to use. Um, and he, here is the process of 
uh, making these uh, uh, deliverables. Uh, so we started with uh, uh, first we can see that the 3D BIM is a, a good visualization of it, uh, and uh, uh, and we see the, the result of the, the structure there. Uh, uh, we were uh, kind of worked out the. Uh, uh, we, we try to combine the VBS uh, from the from the schedule, uh, and uh, there we have some uh, lot of data from from Skanska uh, that we have used this VBS for a long time, uh, and then we use this uh, we call it storyboard. Uh, it's a site planning kind of uh, where you describe how the uh, the process looks like, and we combine these two. And then we came up with the, the main deliverables and the project adapt uh, division of the deliverables uh, that supported the execution. And then we took each deliverable and uh, analyzed it uh, with this uh, location based structure. And then the, this uh, focus group or this uh, stakeholders could, could agree on a project adapt division in construction scope. Um, and we see that this color represents uh, the construction scope then. Uh, and here you see the main uh, deliverables and their uh, unique construction scope for each deliverable. And this is uh, kind of the, the well thought out structure for total beam. Uh, and it seems quite easy. Uh, but when we have used it uh, for time, some time now and reflecting on it and analyze it for some time, we see that uh, this is really powerful uh, and really useful. Um, but it, uh, uh, it's still people that uh, execute uh, products uh, and by using uh, deliverables, uh, you can see that we can uh, um, yeah you, you can see that we can form teams that need to function together to achieve the quality that is required uh, and the team can easily gather the information they need for their delivery and the product management uh, can understand how to lead guide support and follow up each team and their deliverables uh, uh, and it's really like uh, I had a picture that I added this morning. Uh, it's come up here, uh, but it's kind of achieving operational excellence, excellence uh, where you combine the the teams and the process and the information and put them together. Then you can, uh, with a sustainable vision, you can really uh, monitor and, and guide the, the team to to be efficient. And then then I think you can. Uh, you will be successful in, in your project, and uh, this will probably uh, make us grasp the, the, the digital twin. Um, and we will now see if we can manage a live test uh, of uh, uh, Stream, we might see some examples. This is uh, always a little bit scary uh, to see if this uh, will function. Uh, this is the actual project uh, that's up running now. Uh, and we can see first uh, this, uh, how these uh, deliverables uh, look like. I, as in TV shows, I've prepared something. Uh, so here you can see this uh, deliverable uh, foundation and groundwork uh, and how uh, this is working. Uh, how we filter the information and uh, as uh, Matthias said, you have this uh, structure of them. Uh, so here you have this uh, Deliverable that in Swedish is Prohun set up, and we have this construction scope that we say it's Prohun's deal in Swedish. Uh, 
Uh, so we add this information on each object in the model, and then you can just filter them uh, to, to see how they look like. And go on and see this. Uh, internal work uh, and we will look a little bit further on this internal work and see how it looks like when we, we do we do it on site and do this checklist of it. Uh, there you have the, the denominator structure, uh, the structure, the, the information. And then we can use that for doing checklists. So uh, we build up this uh, structure for checklists. And here you see these denominators uh, that build up the structure. And then you can go into uh, different checklists where you will create them. So you have the, the balcony doors uh, that are, are mounted on, on site, and you can see the, the process here, which one is done and which one are in process and which one have not started. And you can see that there are something, some uh, balcony doors that have not been in place yet, and that's uh, because of the logistics on the, on the site. They will be mounted later. Uh, so you can really uh, visualize the, the progress. And we, the site seems to uh, see that this is really powerful way of uh, uh, sitting in, in these uh, meetings and then discuss how, how work goes on, on on site. And then uh, just click on here and they see visualize the, the progress. Uh, so this is uh, the way we're doing it. Uh, for the for the uh, so this is for the manager mainly uh, they set up these checklists and then they can visualize the the progress uh, for the for the workers on site and uh, the best way is uh, to really go in Building. So you are on your floor that you are working uh, right now, and then you just click on the on the door. Uh, then you should. Click on the, the balcony door, and then you see that here we have these checklists. Uh, and then you can just go into and uh, see what should be done. Uh, and this, uh, you have this uh, meeting where with the, the skilled workers, uh, and uh, you go through what moments, uh, what things you should, in, in what order should you do your work. And uh, what should we do a checklist of so we can be comfortable that we have done the quality in a good way. So they have, they have agreed on, on some things that they should add in the checklist. Uh, so for instance, uh, they think that uh, photo yeah, is really great to see that they've done their, their work. I'm sure tell you the truth, uh, but here you can add any kind of information uh, that are interesting for the maintenance or whatever. Uh, so when you are using the building, you can go into the model and then you just go in and check uh, what kind of window was this, uh, what the unique code for this. Uh, if there are some complaints, uh, you don't need to go out there and, and write down the, the code. You can just click on the model and you have all the information you need. Uh, so the uh, the skilled workers are really satisfied with this. 
um, and I think that uh, uh, it's an easy way for them to really understand what I'm supposed to do. And it's easier for them to just uh, add, uh, yeah, you can kind of add information in the process. Uh, and uh, you can add the deviation uh, uh, to send to the designers if they need to change something. So, uh, and it brings some comfort for the skilled workers as well, because when they come to the meeting, they can really visualize that and say that, yeah, I'm finished with my work. I, I'm in time with this work. Is there any question? Is there something you would like to, to see? You talk about the skilled worker and their satisfaction. You had a bit of this example where there was this hook bump and tape here and so yeah. on. Wouldn't one possible reaction from a skilled worker not be to say, I now I need to click yes on every of this hook bump and this thing and here and there, but I'm skilled. So you ask me, is the door okay? I tell you yes, and that means all these things are in place. I don't want to click yes on every single one of them. Are, are they worried about that focus, so to say? Wouldn't the better use of their skill not be to say there is something extraordinary about this door, so we better note that down in the model, so to say? How, how is, do you have that type of conversation? Yeah, uh, because uh, we are quite early adapters for this. Uh, we have this. Uh, paper checklists uh, on Skanska that we are supposed to use. So now we just took the paper checklist and then we put them here and then uh, it becomes easier for the skilled workers to just click yes, yes, yes. Uh, but of course, I, I think that uh, the work preparation should be the meeting where you, you as a group decide what, uh, what checklist, what should we put on the checklist to, to confirm that we are have done the work properly. Uh, so uh, I think this uh, could be developed uh, better. Uh, and uh, as I said, yeah, I rather say that you just click in that everything is OK, and then you add the deviation rather than click on a lot of points that uh, you should confirm. So yeah. All right, thanks for the light demo as well. Uh, I have two questions. Number one. How many individual data sources or heterogeneous sources were pulled in to sort of have the, to be into having this information manifested? And secondly, sort of similar to the first question, how did you interact with the say skilled workers, workers, etc., from the UI UX perspective? And did they bring as a part as part of that iteration, did they say, in addition to that paper list, do you know what? You could do X, Y, Z, and is it easy to hold that in in terms of the information? Okay, the first question about sources. Um, I showed you that was a lot of data sources that need to be combined to 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 get the value, um, and we can see that uh, in this case it's uh, more or less like the model source and the uh, work preparation source that are bring together. Uh, but we also see that we have the calculation source because you, you want to know the the model. We don't model everything. Uh, I usually say that we model 60% maybe. And if you add uh, calculation, you maybe come up with 80%. Mm -hmm. And then you have some uh, experience uh, that you add and so, so in some way, you add 100 percent in, in what when you said that you're finished. Okay. Uh, so mm -hmm. I should say that you have the model and you have the calculation and there you have the the time as well uh, that you are supposed to like, can use uh, uh, for this for this uh, uh, mounting or this job. Uh, so uh, but we have also other connections that I haven't mentioned, but uh, model and schedule. Uh, and uh, some inspection plan uh, that you add to the model. And you can see uh, the connections there. So, do you, do you try to homogenize this uh, using a central schema or something, or do you leave that? Like, how do you manage those? 
we still don't have any app that combines everything. Uh, so we don't have a single app for the production management. Uh, and I think uh, I'm more interested in, in building an ecosystem with different apps and different processes to be able to monitor everything. Uh, I don't think there will be one program. So, so if, I mean, in this case, the, there is only the model that we see and there is the primary data source here. The other sources are implicit because they are knowledge that the people bring to the, yeah. to the meetings. So the, there is only, and perhaps you, you put in the, the checklists, uh, mm -hmm. so those are also part of the, the data source, but otherwise that's, that's only the model. And one of the really interesting thing is when you have this just object to add, then it's easy. But uh, when you have a volume like a concrete, then you have uh, kind of an, an information of the volume in the model and they have a volume in the calculation. And then you have the actual uh, concrete uh, board. Uh, and then you can really compare these three sources and see, OK, the truth, the truth is within this uh, kind of. Uh, and then you can uh, uh, start analyzing uh, and uh, start to get more accurate experience or what you say, uh, get more learning uh, in the calculation. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering how does Skanska skill up workers? Is that the Arbets leader who has responsibility to check that everything has been put in, or is every worker that has the responsibility of their own work? And what's the process to skill up somebody who maybe is not uh, digitized as yeah. culture? Uh, we have been struggling a lot of, with different apps. Uh, how interactively are they and how easy are they to, to use? Uh, and we see um, give some credits to, to streaming maybe, but, but this program, I see that um, I should really mention Yusef. It's one of the foremans there. Uh, he's just been in the construction industry for a couple of years. And since he was the youngest foreman, he, uh, they said to him, you fix this. <laughs> uh, and uh, within six months, he, he learned the program. He learned uh, the construction uh, process. Uh, and he started doing checklists. Uh, and he uh, collaborated with the skilled workers. Uh, and together with the skilled workers, they are now making this happen. Uh, so just in a, a couple of months, uh, and uh, we saw that the uh, market with the ground worker, and uh, we said that okay, just skip them. They they may maybe they'll need to manage this uh, this uh, stream beam. Uh, but the first day they came there, they started doing checklists. So just in a couple of hours, they did their own checklist in in stream beam and used that. And uh, so this is also a great tool. So. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's fast learning. This guy was absolutely fast learning. What about seeing uh, one uh, one year to retirement? Maybe or uh, very very knowledgeable, yeah, but difficult to set in uh, this flow. Yeah, and I think this is uh, um, it's a great challenge. And I think uh, this is uh, one way of uh, transforming uh, the knowledge that they have to the young, younger generations. Uh, and it's, it's quite easy to use. I think even the, the old guy can use it uh, and they are using it as well, so. But, but we, we have talked a lot about this and, and uh, it seems like uh, to make them find a value for them to realize what, what seems for me. And once they do realize that, then they are, they're on the train somehow. Yeah, and I think uh, discussion connected to the checklist and that is okay. Do you want to do it on paper or do you want it on your phone? <laughs>
and then uh, it's useful for up, up to the yeah because it's easier yeah okay. Jenny do you have any Kind of comments. <laughs> yeah, so Jenny is working at the uh, big string and they they are also using this approach. But I, I suppose you have the same learning experience from yeah, it's, it's good. yeah. No, my question is uh, sorry, um, I was just interested to know because you were talking about how we move from the as build to, uh, from the as plan to the as build. Yeah. Um so I was like, I'm curious about because let's say that this is now the the process of like developing and adding information on the go. So as they build, then the model gets more information and more yeah. information. But how this relates, or how because for me it's like a bit confusing how this relates to this kind of LOD discussion. So how how much level of detail we need in order to develop an as build model? So how much? Because in this case, now I see that the model, of course, maybe it has all the information that is needed in order. So we don't need to model every single screw, of course. But how does your work relate with this? Or uh, like, are you planning then in the end to develop like a very high LOD model to deliver to the client or to the user? Or is this like, how do you think about this? Yeah, I think uh, the, the powerful thing, uh, I think in, if we go to Norway, they are talking about MME, Maturity mm -hmm. Modeling Index. Uh, so in that case, they are more saying how mature the model is in the process. Is, is it for ready for construction? And then they have numbers from yeah, yeah very structured way. Yeah. yeah, and I think that by these denominators, you have a, a structure for adding and complement information. Uh, and it's still an iterative process. So this is not a design iterative process, it's a project uh, iterative process. So within the construction process, you add information, and then maybe the deliverables need to be uh, more granular, uh, or you have new information that comes in, and you need to put that in, in the structure. So when you do this iteratively, you can see that uh, you add more and more and more information and the MME of the load will become higher. And uh, hopefully we can reach digital twin. So yeah, I think I'll turn over to my colleague. Yeah, yeah. yeah see, it's certainly fine. Good discussion, but a uh, lot of <laughs> <laughs> behind it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so uh, um, if I was talking about how we actually did Create um, information during the construction process, and Oliver, we talked about driving circularity with total data. Yep, how basically part of them can be used to increase sustainability. So, on the one hand, we're seeing the new climate regulations coming into force, um, which may actually drive more digitalization, BIM, and total BIM. Um, and obviously, I think everyone kind of understands that there's a need to reduce the climate impact of buildings to meet the net zero targets laid out by the EU. It's kind of ob obvious. And in the EU, particularly Sweden here, at the beginning of last year, they started to enforce climate declarations. But at the moment, or at least then, um, there's several problems with them. So there's no limit values or like maximum permitted values on what you can actually, um, in terms of emissions, used to construct. They don't include all building elements. They're not required for renovation projects. They use standard reference values um, rather than specific data for things like installation, stuff like that. Uh, however, they have been updated this year. Uh, they also are usually static calculations at set points in time. So they're like beginning of the project or at the end of the project to show them climate impact of the building or whatever, um, rather than on an ongoing process throughout the project. Part of the reason for that is that they're costly to produce. Um, and But as we continue to work towards net zero targets, these are being iterated upon and getting tougher and tougher all the time. So it's important to understand maybe one way to address that. That's kind of where Total BIM comes in, um, as we've spoken a little bit about already, so I'm not going to go over this too much, but we already 
talking about model-based construction, where like Ephraim spoke about as well, we have the detailed model already. Uh, and then building on the use of that, how can we combine that with sustainability? We were fortunate enough to have a very interesting case to look at, um, of a total BIM project in Uppsala, Sweden, a big standing project, which is a renovation project to convert offices towards mixed use, which is going to be offices, hotels and apartments. But in this case, we're just looking at the office part of the renovation. It's um, run by a construction management company responsible for both the design and construction in the project. And the project aims to reuse as many materials as possible, including things like plasterboard, joists, carpets, radiators, bricks, suspended ceiling tiles, which would usually end up in landfill, um, kitchenettes, sheet metal, windows, doors, glass partitions, etc. Uh, and this is part of my PhD project, which is looking at total BIM. Uh, and we've had really great discussions with industry experts in workshops, site visits, and specifically for this project, we conducted some semi-structured interviews with, and also held a seminar with the construction management company's project leader. But then, okay, a little bit more about the details of the project. So the original project or building was from the 1970s and fitted out with materials from the 1970s. So perhaps it has that look, but the materials when they took over were in really good condition. Uh, and it seemed, as far as we understand, you know, a shame to waste all those materials and basically dispose of them. Very few of them are normally recycled or reused. And the company's aim was to basically, as I said, reuse as many materials as possible. So if we take an example like the doors here, um, during deconstruction, the doors were dismounted, etc. Um, and all the information about the door was then entered into a materials database where you store things like the dimensions of the door, the sound rating, fire rating, basically all information about the door, including a photo of the door, it's all put into a database. And then from that, it generates a unique product code uh, on a label that can be printed out and then tagged on the door physically with an RFID chip as well used for tracking logistics purposes as well. But how does that then integrate into the whole kind of reuse process? Because you've just got the materials, which is which are stored in the material database here. But how do you then decide like what to use and where it should go? The designers basically create the BIM model in Revit, a highly detailed model, and everything there starts basically as a baseline and modeled as new. This gives also a baseline for the carbon emissions so they can see the climate impact of basically what it would be if everything was built new. And then um, through discussions with the clients and tenants, for example, they can decide which materials they want to actually then reuse in the project and the property sets for those materials in the Revit model are then updated uh, basically with a reuse tag. And through an algorithm then it matches uh, what is stored or what the designer's intent is for the reused materials, it then finds the <clears throat> inventory materials in the database and then matches them together and pushes a code or well, the unique code that was generated during disassembly. It pushes that code then back into the Revit model with the exact item that should be then constructed or used for construction. And the workers can also see that through um, StreamBIM, which Ephraim demonstrated a little bit too. So that code is also then in StreamBIM for the site workers to install as well. And they know exactly which material, which object should go in the right location. At the same time, uh, climate calculations are performed on the model. So I said there was a baseline and then they can see then the impact of the reused materials that they've chosen. And that generates ongoing climate reports throughout the project so they can see which parts of the project have got worse or better over time in terms of carbon emissions. Some of the ones that, for example, look worse are because, um, I mean, that may happen, but because more and more objects become known as the project goes on as well. But like I said, one of the important factors here is that there are discussions, data-driven discussions with both tenants and clients as well. So prospective tenants or higher guests aren't told, okay, you have to have all these recycled materials. They're given an informed choice 
like we strongly recommend you could have these reused materials you know we can recondition them for you we can repaint them we can sort them out so that it looks good you can have new materials if you want but it's going to cost you this much more and have like this much more of a climate impact so i think after some initial skepticism as well the more and more the project went on the more that like prospective tenants were actually keen on this reused material because it'd been refurbished and things in a really good way and that is also actually taken into account in the model in terms of like if something needs to be repainted the transport costs are also taken into account the repainting costs are also modeled in terms of climate impact so there's overall still managed to make a significant climate saving with the project too what we find though is that there's a heavy reliance on total bim as i started off by saying as well because you really need this highly detailed model to begin with uh, in order to be able to work with linking the objects towards like the reuse and um, without such a highly detailed model it wouldn't necessarily be as easy one interesting fact as well was that you would anticipate that this would take a lot more time effort and cost but what we actually found was that it was comparable or what the company said was that it was comparable to recycling um, where you usually have to sort materials into the different containers, transport them down to the containers, et cetera, as well. Uh, however, it's obviously not comparable to demolition, but that has a much greater climate impact trying to work sustainably. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the standard reference values were useless, oh, the company said. Um, so, for example, the installations, that's usually calculated on maybe like contract size or maybe area, something like that. But the case company decided to actually model uh, the climate impact in a lot more detail, uh, even though it presented a worse picture of the project. However, Bobak have kind of also recognized this and updated the values recently this year. That said, there are many challenges that still remain. Uh, who's going to take responsibility for working this way? Are clients going to take responsibility now? To do more than the minimum that the climate declarations kind of require you to do if it sort of doesn't earn the money are the tenants always willing to have reused materials in perhaps high-end projects if they're going to be moving into a brand new refurbished building how do you have the conversations with them to have the reused materials you need to be able to show them that it can be reused in the right way same with the contractors is going to maybe take more time and effort for them to get up to speed with these working processes and suppliers as well. I mean, today they're mostly incentivized to sell new materials rather than refurbish existing ones. Accessibility regulations are also an issue. Uh, I used the example of doors before. The project had 100 existing doors that even with special hinges adapted, especially uh, for the project which extended the opening of the doors, they were still five millimeters too small for well, what the current accessibility regulations are. I understand that's sort of an ongoing discussion and they might discuss it with regulators, but they decided to proceed with that anyway. Just that uh, it might not always be completely straightforward to reuse materials. And then similarly, there's the opportunity cost. Here's like an example of radiators where I think they found the radiators were in really good condition, but perhaps on a few days of the year, the radiators might not have the optimum performance to perform, perform as well as new radiators, where the building's central heating system would need to sort of compensate for it as well. So when do you choose to reuse old materials or when do you choose to use new ones and how does that play into climate impact discussions? But sort of in summary, we find that these climate declarations may actually be the driving force for implementing more digitalization and total BIM to really have sort of a data driven process. But at the same time, total BIM is kind of required for working this way. Um, because total BIM, you're really using the model to sort of construct from. So in order to have that, you have the kind of as built model already. Reflects the reality or similarly with digital twin but then there's quite many challenges that remain mostly due to incentives who's going to particularly 
drive this and do more than the minimum, at least in today's day standards. But as we see, um, these climate regulations are coming into force quite quickly. And I think by 2025, they're already planning on implementing like limit values as well to the climate declarations as well. I think we're a bit short on time, so I yeah, yeah. over to Michael as well. I don't know. It's actually lunch now, but yes. um, we we can I can keep that for the next digital security because then I also have to so if you are interested to to hear about Michael and uh, what we have done with virtuality and stuff like that, you can say otherwise you can uh, it's lunch type. Or everybody could go for lunch. I mean we Or do we have any with eye keep, candy you yeah, can we show keep up? That for <laughs> Matthias, actually ask Matthias how much time do we have? Well, you have to be flexible. It might be twenty minutes and it might be two minutes. <laughs> so uh well, this was just one thing with it, I can say quickly, is that with the total beam uh, concept, it's very easy for us to use uh, VR, for instance. And uh, we use that already for design review. I mean, these people are the end users of a school, so they can easily uh, read the blueprint. Uh, with a VR model, they can spot the, the design arrows, uh, point them out. Uh, we can use it for constructability review. Uh, because the design might be okay, but it might be not be perfect uh, from a constructability perspective. So it's if we draw the pipes differently, we might have more uh, space. Uh, Skanska uh, sometimes use this for uh, job planning uh, to see the sequencing, maybe changing that because here we do not have so much space. We see that now in VR. Uh, so these are all things that we can use VR for quite easily because with Total Beam we always have a 3D model. Uh, but the thing is that when we go to site layout planning, this is traditionally done by the contractor um, on a blueprint, adding stuff. Um, it could be uh, machines, cranes, temporary structures, safety measures. And the thing is that, as we now have seen, the industry is moving from blueprints to model-based. So how does this fit into this? Um, so the idea was to, we can, we have examples of doing site layout planning in 3D, but it's not always easy to make the contractor manage Revit, for instance, to create a new building information model. So the idea with this project was actually to see if we could use, come up with some simplified system uh, to make non-designers create a uh, B model, so to say. And we have experience from that, uh, from healthcare planning, where the actual end users plan their own environment uh, using a combination of multi-touch table uh, VR and, uh, yeah, multi-touch table and VR. So the idea was, can we do that also for site layout planning? So quickly, uh, this is what we came up with. Uh, and this is integrated with the IFC models. We load IFC models from design, add component either in a multi-touch 2D interface or directly in uh, VR. Um, and the thing is that uh, we can then uh, get this integrated with the other BIM models uh, because we can export this directly to IFC. So we take IFC, we add some components easily, and then we export to a new building information model that becomes the site component model. And we did some quick evaluation with this uh, on safety components. First thing we saw was that if you should plan the safety, the guard rays uh, from a 2D blueprint, a lot of people misses some openings. They did not miss that in VR. And they could then uh, add the safety components, which we could then export directly to an IFC file and integrate with the other stuff. So that was basically sort of the, the, the test we did here. So, um, for future work, I guess we will try that out more because this is um, 
Well, we have total BIM, basically all the data needs to be sort of almost BIM models. So this was uh, one thing to, to come up with a system where they could uh, plan this uh, themselves using multi-touch table and VR. Yeah. Was that two minutes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But maybe next year I can have a more detailed presentation <laughs> you have around this system and how we have uh, evolved development. That's not like involved development. You know, have live demos. <laughs> but that's, I think, the most. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I mean, I, yeah, so but it's presented. So, large now? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's not perfect.